people are joining. We'll give it a few minutes. I like watching the numbers go up as people are joining. <laughs> yeah. Hello, everybody. We're going to give it a little time to let everybody join. We're getting there. I'll probably give it like three minutes if that's okay, Elaine. Oh, yeah. Okay, people are still joining. Hi, everybody. I'm not sure if if uh, they can raise their hand to say hello back, but if not, uh, two participants raise their hand. <laughs> Six, seven, eight. Okay, thanks, guys. See, you can use that, Elaine, when you ask everybody to raise their hand at the different um, parts of your questions. Right. Let me see if it lets me see. Nine. The only thing is it doesn't tell me who they are. If you guys want to, uh, in the Q&A, say hello with your name, go right ahead. Because I love to, to see my peeps from all over the world. So go ahead. Okay, we're going to give it one more minute and then we'll start. Okay. Hi, Helene. Hi, Laura. How are you guys doing? Laura, uh, um, we miss you over here because you moved to Florida, my friend. And um, maybe I'll get to see you because I'm going to the conference. Hi, Barbara. Hi, Imelda. Hey, Mary. How you guys doing? I want to say that. How you doing this morning? <laughs> Hi, Leanne. Laura, Christina. Yes, I miss you too. I'll be at the conference. Yay. I can't wait to see you. Hi, Mary Lou. Welcome from San Jose. Hi, Becky in Illinois. Hi, Christina in Washington. Hey, Susan, my girl. You see, I've got your, your beautiful um, pottery behind me that you made me. Hi, Tamisa. Hey, Arlene. Um, Arlene, chat is different when it comes to the webinar. We only have the Q&A. Hi, Daisy in Northern California. Hey, Camille in Wisconsin. Hey, Tracy in New York, my girl. Hi, Elena. I love it. Some of you I know, some of you I haven't met yet, but it's welcome. Lori. There's Lori Hansley. Hi, Lori. Hey, Lori. Another one that used to be out here in Cali. Yes, Mary Lou, we're going to record and I'm going to make sure I send it. We're also going to be sharing um, the slides um, because there's a lot of important information. Okay, one more minute, guys, and we'll get started. Welcome, everybody. We're almost ready. And Elaine, it'll just continue to automatically um, admit as people come in. Okay. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, good morning, everybody. So I know for some it's afternoon, some it's evening. I want to thank you for joining us today with the Scleroderma Foundation of California's virtual talk with our special guest speaker, Elaine First. And she's going to be providing a very important talk on coping with the chronic disease and do you have what it takes. 
We're always excited to bring these educational forums to you in your own living rooms. And while you hear from the experts in the scleroderma world, because I always say we are in this together. I'd like to personally thank Elaine for taking time out of her busy schedule to be with us on a Saturday and provide this extremely helpful and what I think is a hopeful presentation to the scleroderma communities near and far that help all of our warriors stand a little taller and feel supported when it comes to navigating the various stages of scleroderma physically, emotionally, and mentally. I want to remind everyone that the Scleroderma Foundation of California does not endorse any specific treatments, drugs, or research trials. And because scleroderma affects all patients differently, treatment approaches that may be appropriate for some patients may be less suitable for other patients. Any treatment decisions should be based on knowledgeable discussions between patients and their clinicians. After Elaine finishes her presentation in its entirety, we're going to open the floor to the questions from the, um, for the audience in the Q&A box. Uh, please remember to wait until she finishes to type in your questions, and that way I can avoid weeding through questions that might be addressed during her talk. Um, we included a survey at the end of the presentation, and we'll hope that you'll take the time to answer just a few questions um, to provide your personal important feedback. Um, I mentioned this in an email that I sent, but some of you might have registered last minute. Elaine's talk has just a couple of um, slides in the very beginning where she wants to just ask you a couple questions. And um, raising the hand um, can do it, but it doesn't allow uh, us to know the question. So you can put it in the, in the Q&A so we can see it. But um, this will be the only time that there will be an interaction, these first couple of slides. And we just welcome you to answer the question because we wanted to get an idea of, you know, how many of you are today here newly diagnosed, living with it for a while. And, um, and then we'll go on with the uh, presentation. So I am going to um, uh, introduce Elaine now. And it's my, my pleasure to introduce you to her. Elaine is a registered nurse and a nurse educator who has taught in four universities, School of Nursing, worked as a head nurse at John Hopkins Hospital in Baltimore, and administered a psychiatric hospital and program for mentally ill teenagers in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Elaine has given many workshops and lectures on how scleroderma affects people, both patients and their loved ones, and has led support groups for people affected by the disease. Both Elaine and her husband, Dr. First, participate in many scleroderma events, bringing awareness to the disease, raising money for a cure for many organizations supporting scleroderma all over the world. And we greatly appreciate this because they are here to help people from all walks of life impacted by the disease. And we thank you, Elaine. Please join me in welcoming Elaine first. I am going to share screen. I'm going to highlight you, Elaine. Let's see, spotlight. I'm going to share my screen. And I'm going to go, give me one second, everybody. And let's see. Update keep. Well, that's not what we wanted, and I did not want subtitles. Let me unshare my screen for a second because that did not work. All right, I don't know why it's doing this to me. Sorry, everybody. There you go. I don't know why I did that. And the subtitles are still on here. 
It's not what I wanted, my friends. You can see it, Elaine, correct? Yes, I can see it. There you go. Okay. Um, you're highlighted. I am going to go off camera and mute, and you let me know when you're ready for the next slide, okay? Okay. Thank you. Um, hello, and welcome to this webinar. I'm very excited to speak with you. I uh, haven't done it in a while, and it's exciting for me to um, talk with you guys and possibly give you some thoughts, which is really important that you cope with this chronic disease. And um, I wanted to add that um, Dan and I have been working with scleroderma patients and their families and organizations and whatnot since at least um, 1975 when it was just a little blip in his eyes. And it's been fantastic to watch the organizations grow and become much more sophisticated and even more participate in um, tr treatment trials and so forth that um, has helped the treatment of scleroderma very far in a very short period of time. And I'm really glad that um, you all are here today to hear about this. So next slide. Um, this is what we're gonna be talking about. We're gonna be looking at some principles of human because we all have um, the ability to cope with some things and we have to learn how to cope. So if we have some principles about human behavior, that would really be, I think, very helpful for you to think about. Then we're gonna talk about coping. I mean, we talk about coping all the time, but we very seldom define it. And so today we're gonna to be defining uh, what coping means. First time I looked this up in the dictionary, um, it said it's the piece of a wall that, um, that sits on top like tiles on top that sheds rain and other. So building term, as well as a psychological term. Um, we're gonna talk about things that work and things that don't. And then we're gonna share a little bit, if we can, some ideas, some thoughts, some questions. All right, um, I started asking people, audience, who they are, um, because it's helpful for everyone to know that it's not only patients that we're talking to, is that we discovered is that uh, people affected by scleroderma are not only patients, certainly you, and hopefully there are a few of them for you, um, but there are other people who are affected by it that you may have thought about, not only your family but, and friends, but the people that you meet in your life. You go to the dry cleaners and you get to know them over time and they get to know you and you may talk to them about scleroderma. Um, and they're affected by what happens to you. They are gonna change your behave, their behavior a little. Maybe they're not gonna hand you a whole bunch of um, things on hangers because they see and know and have been told that your hands are hurting and they are not in a position for you to carry that that way. So they might make some changes in the way they hand you the um, the people that you, if you ride on buses or if you go on the metro, um, there are people who might, um, you are an educator, unfortunately. This is not fun to have to educate people, but you are an 
an educator and anybody who asks you about your disease is gonna be educated by you one way or the other. So there are a lot of people that you might consider who are affected by your scleroderma or the scleroderma that you are carrying around with you. So next. Okay, so let's raise a hand who is diagnosed. Let's see how many people um, are going to answer that question. How do we do that, Tina? Raise a hand who is diagnosed. It's, it's raising up right now and it's already at 25. Okay. Raising their hand and more and climbing. <laughs> Okay. All right. So there's a bunch. Next line. Next line. Yes. Uh, who is a support person for someone else? So now I have, I see 19 uh, hands raised for that question. Excellent. Um, one of the things that helps people with to um, feel better and to advance in their own coping is support people. Um, we support people. So thank you so much uh, for being interested enough to sit through this webinar. And I'm sure you, maybe you've been through a lot of them. And that's a really good thing. Um, the other thing patients have told me is that it makes them feel heard and seen and cared cared about when friends, family, um, colleagues show up at webinars or in person or whatever kind of um, able to do. Okay, next line. How many have been diagnosed for under one year? So far, 12. Mm -hmm. Actually, it went, I think it was starting over. Um, eight. I see eight. Okay. So you folks are probably not, um, have not, not seen this lecture. Hopefully you've gotten in, involved with books and pamphlets and things from um, our resource, resource at the end, you know a little bit about how to cope with a chronic illness. Um, and I'm really, really glad that you're here because sometimes this is very difficult to confront. But I'm glad you're here and recognize that the more you are, the easier it's going to be for you to live with scleroderma. That has been shown. And one of our, um, the medical advisory board has said many times that the scleroderma patients are the most educated patients in rheumatology. And I think the, all the organizations that have been over the years helping patients to learn about this need uh, kudos for that. So how about over a year but under five. Um, it's going up to 14. Ooh. Actually, it went down one. 13 participants raised their hand. Okay. Um, just a little bit of statistics here. It used to be that most patients without treatment and it's um, now we've got lots of treatments we didn't use to offer patients. But people without treatment usually died by five years. And now that is not happening. But probably you know this that the years are when the disease is the most active. And when it is active is when you get the symptoms and the pain and the difficulty um, 
swallowing or the dry mouth or the hands being difficult to move, and the Raynaud's, et cetera. All of those symptoms tend to be most active within the first five years, um, three or five. So that's when we are focusing on teaching physicians the field, uh, people in small clinics, uh, people in places where there's not a lot of population, to get those physicians to teach them to, to treat early. And so we're also teaching, trying to teach them to diagnose early. So we're reaching out to patients in our areas and as many areas as we can, including internationally, to diagnose scleroderma very early, as early as possible. Um, and treat as early as possible. Um, it, one of the things about rheumatoid arthritis is the same thing, and they are treating rheumatoid arthritis patients so much earlier than they used to, and finding that people don't have to end up in wheelchairs. And we have found that with scleroderma patients as well. Autoimmunity is like that. It rages all over, and then it has to be put under control. And the earlier it's put under control, the better, logical, right? Good. More than five years. Raise your hands. It's climbing. We have a lot of uh, warriors that's been through it. At this point, I see 24. Okay, vets. You guys are the vets. <laughs> <clears throat> been living with the disease for more than five years and um, probably have been talking to people who have had it not as long as that and helping them to look at what kinds of things they can do to keep themselves active, to get involved in volunteering or come to a support group, whatever. Um, so thanks to all of you letting us know all of this. Um, it's interesting that we had quite a few, um, eight people, did you say, that was under a year? Correct. I'm so glad that you came. Very important and very hard to do sometimes. Okay. Um, welcome to everybody and slide, please. Thank you. Um, and I want to say I noticed that there is a glitch when um, Elaine's speaking. And unfortunately, we both try to uh, play with our Internet and sometimes we just don't have control over it. So I I sincerely apologize and hope that everybody can hear everything. OK, I just wanted to mention that and I'll go to the next slide. I can tell you, um, Tina and I are going to be on the phone to Spectrum any minute now. <laughs> Okay, we're going to be talking about principles of human behavior. First line. Okay. Third line. Fourth. Principles of human behavior I'm going to cover. Um, next slide. Okay, all behavior has a reason. I've heard um, mother, little two-year-olds say, oh, he's tired, or he's hungry, or he's just a brat, which I hate hearing. Um, but all behavior has a reason. Generally, people act the way they do. Next line. To reduce psychological pain. So this is the reason why people who have scleroderma, mostly in their fa face and fingers and hard skin and the whole thing, a lot of times people try and out of public places at the beginning. They're not used to seeing their face that way. That doesn't look like them as much as it did. And it feels terrible. 
and to reduce the psychological pain of what they consider to be disfigurement, people sometimes hide um, and get very introverted and do not want to be seen. So that's an example of why that behavior is that way. Next line. Goes into the first psychological pain line where you want to retain who you are and your self-respect and the respect of others. Generally, why we do anything, why we're nice to people, because I'm a nice person, so I'm going to be nice to people, or wrong person, and I don't need that stuff from you, so I'm going to go over here and not talk to you about that. Um, there are lots of different behaviors that we have, but they all lead down to the psychological pain or retaining their sense of self and self-respect. So think about that when you're thinking about how you're coping. And we'll talk a little more about that. Next. So they want to retain their comfortableness with physical um, self, as well as their emotional self. Physical self, if you're cold, put on a coat. If you're starting to rain notes, put on gloves um, to stay comfortable physically. However, if you don't want people to see you with gloves on in the middle of summer, because you're gonna go into an air conditioned building, emotionally, you will not want to wear these gloves. So if you, you have to override these kinds of thoughts because you know that if you don't stay warm, you're gonna have a little bit more damage in your fingers um, from having a Raynaud's attack than if you stayed comfortably warm. So if you stay comfortable physically and yet it's gonna get you a little embarrassed, you're gonna to have to deal with that embarrassment and you're gonna to have to put on those gloves. And I know it's hard, especially if you're young and gorgeous and you're dressed and you just don't wanna put gloves on. I really understand that. Um, however, at any time I'm in a group um, with people that, whose fingers are turning white, blue and red, um, I usually, discuss it with them a little bit because I know that there's damage happening in those fingers and maybe in the lungs as well. Next. Okay. The light bulb principle. Click again, Tina. There you go. How many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Those of you who've heard this before know the answer. Well, it takes one, but the light bulb has to want to change after, okay. And that's very, very true. Um, those of you who have um, know that when there are two and they don't wanna go somewhere, they're not gonna be persuaded unless you pick them up and move them. Unfortunately, with our husbands, or our wives or our ch large children who are 15, 16. So you can't make somebody do something they don't wanna do. However, you can change people's attitudes with some education. So if you think about when somebody is really, really, really um, resisting changes in their lives. You gotta go back a little, sit down and talk about it with them. I'm thinking of family members who don't want, who are afraid, who are um, uneducated about your disease. 
and who won't come to meetings with you, um, who don't want to, and this happened, um, especially in teenagers, some husbands um, have a really difficult time with this because they sign up for um, having to live with chronic disease in you. Um, so what is it that you about that? And there are some ways of dealing with it. Next. This thing that people often don't tell you when you are facing a chronic disease, but chronic disease comes and goes, especially the autoimmune diseases. There are flares and there are remissions. There is not a cure at this point, but chronic disease waxes and wanes. So you're gonna have wonderful days and you're gonna have days where you do so much and the next day you're gonna be in bed recovering because you, were, you overdid your body a little bit. And people don't actually say that very often, but you'll know when your disease is getting active. Um, and then you say to yourself, okay, what can I do about this? And this is where your resources come in. That when your um, aches and pains get too much, you have medication for that. You know that to um, make yourself stronger, you need to exercise, not too much, but a little. There's gentle, gentle exercise videos everywhere now. We have people who are yoga, especially for autoimmune disease folks. Um, there's water aerobics for exercise. Um, do when the disease is active, you can rest. You learn to say no to things um, and recognize when you need to stop so that your body can catch up with your mind because we are busy people most of the time and, and sometimes we have to back up and stop that. Um, there is a saying that says you can do anything but you can't do everything. Very hard. It's hard to give that up, uh, to give up your activities because they define sometimes who we are. So there's a is something you can do when the disease is active. So ask yourself that question. Instead of feeling down in the dumps, like the little guy on the bottom, and feeling like, oh, I did something terrible to myself, and now what am I going to do about it? Well, that's the important question. What can you do about it? Choices now. And sometimes you can prevent a flare or a complication, and sometimes you don't. Um, sometimes you can't do that. Um, with the mom who, when she got a cold, blamed herself. And when I went through nursing school, I sat her down and I said, Ma, when you get a cold, it's because you were around people who had colds. It's nothing that you did wrong. You don't have to feel guilty about getting cold. None of us are healthy all the time. And so she thought about that and she stopped. Uh, blaming herself as so um, remember that sometimes you can prevent it and some and sometimes you can't um, but trying to prevent it is a good thing and you have resources and we'll go into those too the next slide really fancy with this <laughs> okay this might be one of the more important slides. Who decides who's in charge? I'll bet you, you guys know. Who decides what you can do and what you can't do? Who's the person who controls thinking outside of the situation to the questions that you need to ask yourself? Where's my scissors? Look at the guy who's freeing himself. Put a woman in there too, since 75% of scleroderma patients are women. 
So scissors, that's a great question. How am I gonna um, get out of this? Who is controlling your attitude? Remember that an attitude is in your control. And that leads me into the next slide. Now this looks a little small to me, but um, um, when, T when you ask Tina to send you the slides, this one will be very big for you. And there is also in the rest of the slides, there is an empty one. It says control, but it doesn't say the rest of them. And it says things I can't control, but it doesn't say the rest of those. Um, this, this I think is one of the most mind freeing um, slides that I can put a lecture like this. Because if you divide things into things you can control and things you can't control, it's very clear that you have more control over what's going on and your responses to what's going on than This was done by a woman up in the Evergreen, or what was the Evergreen chapter in Washington State named Jamie Garrity. So if you meet her, um, you can tell her that she's famous or seen her control heart. So if you look at some of the things, they will probably resonate with you. things were written during the COVID when people were having real bad time with out of control feelings about what the heck is going on. Um, and so there's stuff in there about avoiding close contact with people and um, washing my hands, my face and this kind of stuff. But it's, it's not, you know, those things are important when you've got a flu season going on and you're in too. So I left them in there. I like it very much. I like the one where my gratitude is under my control. Um, some people have looked at this and have quit going to the news every morning because and it continues to be so dire just in different ways. And how we respond to that is entirely up to us. So look for this empty heart for you to put something in um, when you have the time. Next slide. Okay, here's coping. Um, coping means that you are managing distress and the problem underlying the distress. This is like out of the, um, dictionary. Manage distress and the problem underlying the distress. So that's control. This is very hard for those of us who are goal-directed, always. Goal-directed, you go directly for the goal. You kick that ball directly into the goal. And you sometimes think about what it takes for you to do that. You just go for it. But it is a process, especially when you have a chronic disease, a process of learning what you can do, what you can't do. What is the disease doing to you? And how do you deal with that? A lot of thinking and learning, and sometimes it's a little bit of stress in and of itself. Don't put too much on yourself, but think about it as a process, that it's step by step, that everything you learn has you to learn it, that you can reach out to people who can teach you things, that that would be better than being in the dark about it.
but you have a choice. You can be in the dark about it as long as you like, as long as you're sicker because of that. Next. Coping successfully with a stressor may increase the body's ability to fight infection, decrease depression, and increase a feeling of well-being, which you are in control, even though the disease continues. Because you're not gonna get rid of this disease, you are going to fight it with the medications, with the um, things that you have to keep warm, um, the exercises that you have, the hugs that you get and give, um, even the withdrawal that you might have to do to give yourself some rest. So um, there are people who cope successfully and sometimes they're flare, they flare with the disease and sometimes they don't, but they know what they have to do and they've learned. Next. More. Okay. Now, all of this stuff is based on studies that sociologists and psychologists have done with scleroderma. And our, my favorite psychologist for this is, um, has moved to Texas. Ginny Merrill used to be here, but she moved back to Texas to take care of her mama who has scleroderma so she could be close to mom and dad. Um, but also goes from studies and positive coping adds to the quality of your life. When you learn something, anything, think about kids in school that have learned something that they've worked really hard on and how elated they feel. Into the house and they'll say, look, mom, look what I did. Well, that's positive coping and learning. And this is how people feel when they realize that they've been coping very well. And I hope all of you can realize when you're coping well and you're not, when, you're, when you need a little work. Negative coping, on the other hand, can result in more disability. Very often people um, ignore their symptoms. And always, when you're in a negative environment, when there is negative all around you, when you are negative about yourself, it adds to the pain. Think about being having a headache. There is chaos going on and you have so much to do and you can't do it. And um, it's just a negative atmosphere. The headache gets worse. Next. Okay. So what's so tough about living with a disease? At the beginning, the disease wins. You can't, you are fatigued to the max. Your role in the house, if you have a, a family, um, you are gonna have to give up some things. You can't fold those, that laundry. You can't be the queen of the kitchen. Um, you can't, be the kick of the kitchen. Um, your coping skills are not well developed because you haven't been confronted by this as uh, now. So your coping skills are just a rock, one rock, instead of all those beautiful rocks on the other side. And your disease. Next. And so if you list all the things that you're dealing with, having scleroderma. These are the things that you're living with and it is overwhelming. Just the change in family relationships can be overwhelming. The change in your role as mom or your role as wife, the roles that you have in life, husband, um, breadwinner, um, single mom, there are 
all kinds of things that are happening that have to be changed. And in the beginning, you can't change fast enough. You haven't learned everything. And let me say that there is an up and down um, thought about this too, because as every time you get um, a flare or every time you have to go to the doctor and do the breathing test, maybe they're not so good this time, or maybe you're not sure what they are for two days. And for those two days, you're thinking, oh my God, it, it, it's terrible. I had a tough time this time and my lungs are not doing well. And I don't know what the answer is yet. And I have to wait for two days. It's so you can be on an up and down kind of course, especially at the beginning, but sometimes later as well. So you've got some fear, you've got guilt. What did I do to deserve this? You've got grief and anger and pain. And if you have your change um, in your body, you've got some ideas about and feelings about how your body is changing. You've got a change in your family relationships that you have to negotiate. Loss of income, possibly increased outlay. And there might that you can add to this, which is what I miss about being in person. Um, because there's no interaction between us right now. And I always dearly love to interact with folks that are listening. And if you'll, the first several of these things that you're coping with look very much like um, depression, doesn't it? And um, when you lose someone, um, yes, it's very much like um, with a loss, because it is a loss. Next. Wait, was there one that we missed? Yeah, there you go. Part two. There are the physical difficulties. The others were psychological difficulties. So now you've got the physical difficulties as well to think about, deal with, and your hands, digital ulcers, especially at the beginning, and all of you um, are or will become um, wound specialists. Um, so you can treat some of these digital ulcers yourself at home. Um, dry mouth having trouble going to the dentist, you need to find a dentist who works with children or has pediatric instruments, can get into your small mouth opening. Um, you might have dry vagina from the dryness in general and also your age because the average age of um, onset of scleroderma is between 40 and 60. That's the average. That doesn't mean that younger or older can't get it. Um, joint pain, joint stiffness, especially when you are having a really, really overdue and you have to deal with the pain and stiffness afterwards. Um, fatigue gets in people's way. I can't tell you how many times I've talked with a person with scleroderma who said, I was training for boxing. And then I got this. Or the gym five days because I really enjoyed it or I used to run I used to be a jogger and now um, and fatigue is one of the major things right at the beginning um, as well as the swelling and, and and so forth those of us with fibromyalgia also have some um, that because fibromyalgia is increased when you're stressed and can hurt when you've stressed yourself with a lot of exercise and reflux. Oh, yes, reflux. You will also become a mini gastroenterologist because you need to treat your reflux and you need to know how to do that um, because many people have it. 
people without scleroderma have it as well. <clears throat> we all have to deal with that, those of us that have reflux. Next. Okay. Here are some ways that people cope. So I'm giving you a whole bunch of rocks here. Negative ways. Next. Yes. Now, let me say something about this. Sometimes this, this is not negative, especially at the beginning of this diagnosis, when you're grappling with a word that you may not have heard before, dealing with something that you know, don't know anybody has besides you, um, there is something very restorative for you to, to just sit and think and be by yourself. If that's one of the ways you cope with things is to sit and think about it. Also rest at the same time. If you do this for too long and you're not taking good care of yourself and you find yourself really just not wanting to get out of bed at all, um, even to wash or to eat or change your clothes, then you're depressed. You have every reason to be depressed, but this is a reactive depression to bad news. Reactive depression to something that you're gonna to have to live with and you don't know how. So sometimes hiding, if you overdo that, then you need to see someone, talk about it, maybe get some antidepressants. The good news about antidepressants is they not only help you feel better, but they also help the pain. Some antidepressants are given purposefully to deal with the pain of scleroderma. I'm thinking of Elevil, but there are others. So remember that when you overdo hiding from your disease, you refuse to go to a doctor, you don't want to deal with it, if your symptoms are still there or getting worse, you need to be able to deal with that. You need to tell somebody, uh, it's hard for me to deal with this scleroderma thing. Where do I go? Who do I see? I need to talk to somebody. Um, next. Yes, so that's staying depressed. That's a negative way. Staying depressed with it not dealing with it is negative. Next, using drugs and alcohol, not gonna help. It helps maybe, but eventually it's gonna hurt you really badly, especially the alcohol too. Next, push people away. It's one thing to say, you know, I really need some alone grandson that does that when things get too overwhelming for him he says I need some time to myself right now um, but if you are pushing people away from you and they are reacting to that and they say what are you doing I really want to help well nobody can help me you can't help me you don't know any more than I do and you're pushing people away that's a flag because we need Next, focus only on what you have lost. That will go on forever. It's sort of like getting older. If I focus only on what I've lost, I may as well not be around because every day hey, there's something. So if you only focus on your fat figures or the fact that you can't use your hands like you used to, or um, your face changing or the, the um, reflux that makes you feel like you can't breathe. If you focus only on the negative, the negative will tear you up. Next. If you victimize yourself, then you're lying there waiting for someone to rescue you. And sometimes you won't find that. You have to make the first move. 
So if you become a victim, next. And who are you going to blame? That's if you get into, God forbid, a, a car accident, you can blame the other person that hit you or whatever. But who are you going to blame? Well, people try and find the reason that they got scleroderma. They had a really terrible divorce and got scleroderma. <clears throat> so you can blame your ex, I suppose. Um, you were, you had some sort of a, um, and then you got scleroderma. Um, you live under electrical wires and you got scleroderma. Well, there's no real reason to get scleroderma except genetically. Um, if you have um, autoimmune diseases in your family, if you could point to Aunt, Aunt Maria and she had rheumatoid arthritis, if you can point to Uncle Joe and he had reflux really bad <clears throat> and he had other autoimmune can say that this is part of my family makeup and I just have to deal with it. It's like having certain hair color, certain eye color. We, in, um, in, we have them from our um, ancestors. Um, we can't, so blaming is kind of useless in a way. It's nice if we could find any other real reason, but you got scleroderma and you got to deal with it. Next. Anger can be very helpful, but staying angry and blaming or yelling at them or not being able to handle stress in any way or any of the other things not helpful, not helpful at all. It's a normal response to loss, just like depression. <coughs> but staying angry is only gonna hurt you. Next. This might be the most damaging if you ignore your symptoms. Um, if you get an ulcer and you've had five of them in the last year on your fingertips, on your nail, um, the sides of your nails, on your knuckles. If you've had them and had them and had them, ignoring them, you're ignoring your raynodes, that could lead to gangrene and it could lead to um, amputation sometimes. If you get gangrene is the only way, only reason to have an amputation. Otherwise, those things are handleable if you catch them early and you treat them early. So if you ignore your symptoms, it's only going to make it worse for you and dangerous. Next, refuse treatments. Now that we have treatments, it's sad when people refuse the treatments. I know that people re refuse them so that they can try homeopathic herbs and other homeopathic things, tinctures and so forth, are seen to be um, medications that have side effects. They're healthy, they come from the earth. How can they have side effects? Well, they do. Any of the herbs and spices that we can find um, have normally exist steroids in them. So they have phytosteroids and that can interact with what you're taking. So you need to be careful when you refuse the treatments that have side effects for treatments that seem not to have side effects because they often do. Um, people have overdosed, for example, on uh, valproic acid or John's wort. They've overdosed on that because they want to feel better and get rid of their depression. Well, you can overdose on that and you get side effects from it. It hurts you. So 
um, need to be talking about what the balance is between the side effects and the um, effects that are helpful, especially in the first three to five years, because the point is to try and knock down part of your disease so that you will have less damage. So I understand people want treatments and refusing them. I understand that. I mean, a lot of doctors understand that, but it's a big but. And so you need to pay attention to what the treatments are and how they can help you stay alive longer, which has been happening, which is such good news. Next slide. Okay, let's get positive. <clears throat> positive ways, you can see how the skills um, and the disease are balancing each other out. So as you grow into this disease, unfortunately, and you learn how to deal with it and who your support system are and what you can do about what's happening to you, things bal can balance out. That's why support wonderful is that you can see people who are living well with scleroderma. It's a little scary when you see people who are not living well with scleroderma or who have difficulties with scleroderma simply because the disease is affecting them worse than it's affecting you whatever that means. They have more symptoms than you do. <clears throat> but if you recognize that you're angry, recognize that you have a right to be angry, you have a right to be depressed, and there are things you do about it, that's a positive thing. So is educating yourself. So thank you so much on your behalf. Okay. If you find the right doctor, and the right doctor means someone who has lots of experience in treating scleroderma patients and who fits with you in terms of how he talks to you, she talks to you, um, how educative this person is for you. You can ask them questions all the time. They spend enough. If you find the right doctor, that's very helpful. If you don't find the right doctor, fire him or her, the right doctor. Luckily, those of us who are living in the United States have more and more physicians who know what they're doing. Um, UCLA is a big system for, for training um, people into the, the specialty of scleroderma. Uh, our um, websites for a lot of places that are very rich in good, good sclerodomologists. So find the right doctor. Build your support team and have fun with them. Bring them, bring them bottles of wine. Um, tell them how wonderful they are. Um, if they need some help with finding somebody for another patient in another city, call Tina. Um, Tina information, then um, it looks like she has because she's so short, but she has lots of information. Hello? Okay, I know. Oh, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, you have lots of information. I'm, I'm sending them to you. Absolutely. I the love find the right too. doctor and the find the right um, education place. I have a wealth of information and I love talking to the family. So I'm always here for you and always putting people together and putting a list of um, helpful resources together. Yes, we are blessed. Um, it, you, can, you can build the right team. Um, if you find the right doctor, and sometimes the right doc doctor is somebody who is willing to work with your scleroderma and learn as much as he or she can about it and attend meetings, uh, etc., 
because there are rheumatology meetings all over the place and um, we're, we are educating people in Europe and, and South America and all kinds of stuff, things that never happened before 30, 40 years ago. We have educated a lot of physicians across the world and there are a lot more um, scleroderma patients that are being treated well than there were then. Um, so the doctor is willing to work with your primary care physician or another rheumatologist in another place, then you found the right doctor too, because if he's willing or she's willing, that's great. Um, you need to have a GI person if you have GI symptoms. You need to have a pulmonary if you have pulmonary symptoms. If you have skin things, you need a dermatologist and a wound specialist in that dermatology team. Um, you might need a neurologist. You might need a heart specialist. It depends on what your symptoms are. And those people need to talk, uh, if not personally, they need to be writing letters back and forth um, and keeping track of your press. You need to ask for help and that's a positive thing. Um, and you need to train the persons that are helping you. So if your spouse wants to help you or your partner wants to help you, you might need to tell him or her how to do that. What's helpful when, when this person sits you in a chair, uh, helps you up from a chair? You want to be helped not with your hands. You want to be helped around the waist to lift up, lift up so you can um, use your arms, your forearms to push down. There are ways. Maybe this person needs to come to physical therapy with you so he or she can learn how to move you from place to place. Um, or, you know, if, if you notice that my fingers are turning um, white and blue, can you just get me my gloves? I'd appreciate that. You know, there's lots of things. Treat yourself too, fill in the blanks. There are many ways of treating yourself. And, um, on, under what you can control, put a few things in there. You treat yourself to massage. Um, you can treat to a walk on the beach. You can treat yourself to a dinner out with, with your partner or your family. It, whatever flow, whatever your jam is, remember, treat yourself. Define the verdict. By the verdict, that means somebody said to you early on in your illness, you're going to get worse and worse. Um, I give you five years before it gets really bad. That's not true, for one. For another thing, nobody knows how long. Nobody knows. So whatever you see on the internet, the horror stories or away from that stuff because you are you you have a specific kind of scleroderma that you have and people are living for 40 years more 50 years more a normal lifespan if they get the scleroderma at 40 i know people who are still living with the disease 35 40 years later you saw how many people were over years. So it's the good news. People who take care of themselves, people who are being treated defy the verdict and live longer than they used to. It's wonderful news. It's what one is all going. There are other positive ways that you might want to share with um, us. Um, want to share with your support group um, and have a defy the verdict day and talk about why you're living so long. So, and I'm thinking of a few of you who I know fairly well. So, is 
Um, and, and then there's another few slides here that we can go to. So this is the positive. Oh, look at that. What is successful? Yes, next slide, next line. That's for coping. Next. It's right there. There's your balance. You still have your mind in spite of the brain fog. Um, you have your training in whatever career you had before. And I'm hearing yet, but yes, buts. I'm sensing that there are some yes, yes, but I can't, or yes, but let's look at your abilities from that job anyway. You learned how to work in such and such an environment. You have knowledge about this, this, and this. Positive. Allow yourself to be positive. Next. Okay. First five years, you go to the doctors a lot because your disease is much more active during those, during the first five years than it's going to be later on. So you'll have a spate of doctor's appointments and then things will, will kind of uh, calm down for a while. And then you might have another flare if something happens or this test will be um, cons um, and we'll need some extra treatment and you might feel a little sad about that, but you're living life. You're integrating your disease with real life and that's very helpful. Next. If you think about your life now, are you done? and maintaining your relationships and giving and receiving support. If you're not, work on that. Raises your endorphin levels. It's true, they took blood from people who were having fun and they found that they had more endorphins than people fun. So it, it's a real truly um, mind and body um, integration which is always fun to figure out. The body sometimes knows more than we do. Um, and we just have to find it. So fun can mean a lot of things. Someone up in Washington state who, when she first, and she was a naturalist, she worked in parks um, and kayak and doing all those and found herself flat on her back in the, in the couch, couch watching television and couldn't get up. And that when she puts on her funny comedies that she feels much better. She nap after them and then she feels a little better. Um, she and her husband have developed a wonderful relationship and she have to go kayaking. She's got major amounts of gloves on, but off she goes and they go on traveling now. And she active. Uh, in the past in support groups, but she's too busy now. <laughs> That's one of the good reasons that, one of the positive reasons that people don't come to support groups is because they don't need us because they're having too much fun and they're doing better than they were before. So remember this, fun along with chocolate raises your endorphin level. Um, if you don't like chocolate, just pick something else that makes, gives you a lot of fun. But let me tell you, also raises your endorphin levels. So giving um, four hugs a day, I think they did a study back in the, in the swimming um, that said four hugs a day maintains wherever, where, whatever level you're at. And if you're not feeling well, you need eight. Well. You guys can have as many as you want, which is also a good thing. And then you can't overdose on, on hugs. So just do it. And um, what the other thing that's good about hugs is that you give it as well as get it. 
and take a deep breath and feel it. It's lovely. So hugging is good too. And that fits right in there with the fun and the relationships. Next. Satisfied with yourself and how your life is unfolding. That's very successful coping because you're giving yourself a pat on the back. If you're satisfied with yourself, even though we were taught, well, don't get too self-satisfied. You still are human and you're going to have errors. Okay. But be satisfied with yourself. Be proud of yourself. Um, if you're not proud of yourself, pinpoint something that you're not proud of. Change it as well as you can. If you are able to make changes as necessary, that is very positive. Because remember that little kid coming in from school, very proud of himself. Um, if you can make changes as necessary, that means you've learned some very skills. Being scleroderma is part of your life, not taking over your life. I am, um, it's, I have scleroderma, but scleroderma. Some people say that as part of a mantra. Um, you need to have mantras too. They're very powerful. Um, I have a mantra um, on my wall. It says, I have, I have um, succeeded over tribulations before. So that's a mantra that's really helpful to me. Next. Take a break from the disease. Look, look at um, your ability to fun and maintain, maintain relationships and stuff. Take a break from the disease. Um, when we were younger and had little children, we discovered that if we went away for 36 hours, close enough to home to come back in case there was a problem, but far enough away that we were in a different environment. Um, and we went to a bed and breakfast and we sat in their hot tub and we walked in the woods. It felt like a four day weekend. It was lovely. And we learned a lot about how to take a break from our busy lives and talk about important things. And we did not talk about the children or the bills or anything else. Things that we wanted to talk about, about each other. It was very important to our relationship. And it was very important to give us a feeling of physical renewal as well. So think about it. Um, a staycation is nice. Go to a hotel for one day and get, get as much as lax as you want. It's worth the money, I can tell you. And find a babysitter. That's what your first thing you have to do. Next. Okay. Yeah. So this is our wrap up. And again, I'm, I miss being in the room with you, but what can I do? So um, you can write this out for your own minds. What did you learn today that you didn't know before you came in? And one of the things that people have learned is how much they, and that's very good. That's a lovely thing to think about in terms of yourself. Um, if you're not coping well, according to, what can you do about it? And you can write a list right there that would be helpful. What do you still need to learn to take better care of yourself? It is, it is self giving. If you take care of yourself well, it's not vanity. It's thing well. You've got to take care of yourself and love yourself. See, we're also taught not to do that either. That's supposed to um, vanity, but it isn't. It's survival, and it's it's coping well. Where can you get this information? And you've got your own resources, especially those of you that, that have been living with scleroderma for quite a while. You know who to go to and you know who not to go. You know where the websites are. 
um, that you want to stay away from, and you know um, how to pick those out and remove them. And you know what websites are very helpful and are peer reviewed and so on and so forth. Who are your supporters? And those supporters in your room, please give them a huge hug. Because we all need good supporters. And we are so lucky, we are very blessed when we have our supporters. And I wish I could be in the room with you, Tina, because you're one of the biggest ones. So your hug virtually. Next. Thank you. <laughs> you're welcome. Next. Oh my goodness, our resources have grown. There's an article up top that uh, was very help, very helpful that I got some words from. We've got um, websites for support groups in various places, including Australia and Canada and New Zealand and India and the United Kingdom. That's FESCA. Um, there's FESCA down here on the bottom. Um, it's an international, it's a federation of scleroderma support groups. Um, and they work with the World Scleroderma Foundation. Um, and it would be lovely if some of you can come to the World Scleroderma Foundation meeting in Prague in February. World Scleroderma Foundation. You will find information there about their um, reach to the world, but especially about Germany, about um, Europe. <clears throat> it's grown a lot in the last five or 10 years. Um, <clears throat> so that's, that's, in February, and Dan and I will be there. Um, Tina and Andrew are going to be there. Um, we're doing a lot of outreach with uh, Tina has already talked to folks in Europe and other countries. Um, and we also have reached out to California, Nevada, and out to us. So we're, we're growing um, our support groups here in lots of ways. Next. I just wanted to add really quickly that we don't think we got all of the websites, but we tried to give you a pretty good idea of many out there in different areas because, you know, I keep saying we're in this together. And I'm going to make sure when I send you all the recording that I'm going to copy these so they're clickable for you. They'll be in the body of your email when I send you Elaine's um, final recording of today's um, talk because I think that these are really um, helpful. Um, the couple other pages as well, but I just wanted to let you know that while we'll send you a copy of the slides in a PDF, I'm also gonna make sure that these that have a clickable um, 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 possibility, I don't know why I can't think of the right word, you'll have that in the body of your email. So I just wanted to add that. Can you send me a copy as well of this? Of this? Yes, happy to. Thank you. Um, just to give you an idea about how about why it is that I'm so delighted to see all of the all of the international stuff going on. Um, Thirty five years ago, when I started going to ULAR, which is the European League Against Rheumatism, um, and it's but there are sixteen thousand doctors, nurses, um, researchers, uh, scientists, et cetera, et cetera, that come to that sixteen. 35 years ago, there, was, uh, there were a couple of lectures on scleroderma. Dan, of course, was in one of them, and they had a panel. There were like nobody. It was like five, 10 people, and they all had scleroderma patients, and they didn't know what to do with them. And, you know, it was like they did one small um, meeting room. That was it. Now, they have auditoriums, auditoria, filled with people who are interested in learning about scleroderma. The latest stuff, the um, 
fantastic studies that, that we're all doing and all the patients that are involved in them. And we have patients coming to some of those is, has a presence there and we have a presence there. So I'm just so delighted to see all the changes that have happened and very gratifying to see that and to feel part of it because I know Dan has definitely been part of it. He has a group of people that he's worked with for all, for your benefit. And I'm very glad to, that you have that. Um, families coping with autoimmune disease. Um, is the Autoimmune Disease Organization, the American Rare Disease Association, but I think it's autoimmune now. And that's a great website. Every professional website that um, are for doctors and patients and whatnot has really generally really good um, articles and, and explanations and so forth um, for patients and families to um, look at. There's Ginny. She was in sclerodermanews.com and wrote a very nice article. Uh, I'm sorry, it was a video that, that she was in. And um, I recommend that video to look at for caregivers. Next. Um, Vanessa is another wonderful person. She's a sociologist, I think. And um, a lot of work with her uh, grad students um, studies with scleroderma patients. She's got a, a bunch of on the internet. Look her up on the internet. Um, she's at UC San, San Diego and you can look up uh, Vanessa Malcarni on the internet and find a lot of her um, writings along with this book, uh, Systemic Sclerosis by Clemenson first. Um, and that might be, I'm, I'm thinking that it's probably on Amazon still, and it might be cheap. It's been out for a while. Um, but that's been um, one of the main textbooks in systemic sclerosis. Um, so rheumatology.org, arthritis, um, the Arthritis Foundation, is the American College of Rheumatology. Arthritis.org is the American uh, is the Arthritis Foundation. The Cleveland Clinic website, Mayo Clinic has a website, and the National Scleroderma Foundation has a website that still has um, printable brochures, as far as I know. And then on the bottom is NIAMS, National Institute of um, autoimmune skeletal diseases, NIAMS, um, from the NIH, and they have lots of topics. And you go to um, clinical, um, it's a National Institute of Health, Health has a website for clinical research. And if you go into that website, type in scleroderma, you will come up with all the research that's going on now for scleroderma. You might need a translator because this is for um, the researchers, but you may not need a translator. What do I know? You, you might have all of those um, skills to read that kind of stuff. But it's, it is showing you what um, studies are being done in the, this country and other countries who want to get on that website. Um, Dr. Maureen Mays in, um, in Houston has written a scleroderma book for everyone. It's lovely, second edition. And she's on, for sure, she is on Amazon. And then you have your support group and the internet, your own intelligence. And in your support group or your family, and most of the time, I'm hoping, I'm hoping that your family is your support group. There are some people who 
had a dysfunctional family before scleroderma and still has a dysfunctional family after scleroderma. So sometimes things don't improve for some people, but the people improve. So coping. Next. And there you go. That's for you to build. And you can change it. So put it in pencil and you can wipe out things. You know, for example, you can wipe out things you can't control if you can find ways to control them. And it says, thanks, Tina. You, um, she redid that other slide so you can write on this, which is good. Thank you. And I wanted to say that when they first developed this, it, it was focusing on COVID. And if there was a way I could have erased that, I would, because we want this to be a focus um, on today, not specifically uh, COVID anymore. But I couldn't get that out. I'm not that tech savvy, unfortunately. Two. So what, what you did was perfectly fine. And now we have it. So good for you. Thank you. Um, Again, no, next slide, next. There's something that comes up, there we go. Got a little, a little fancy with this thing. Um, thank you very much for being here. I appreciate your willingness to listen and I'm glad you were here. Thank you so much. And thank you, Elaine. That was a wonderful presentation, and it was very helpful for people to learn much more about coping skills. Maybe some of you sort of used this as a checkoff list and found that you were doing a lot of these things, and maybe there's some areas that you learned that you can add you know, to your arsenal of coping and just knowing that you have other people that really understand you and you know her, her emphasis on support, whether it's your family or um, a support groups, because it's great to have family support. But boy, isn't it beautiful to be meeting people, you know, in your local communities that can finish your sentences because they're living with scleroderma too. So we want to thank you. And I'm going to uh, stop sharing the screen and I'm going to allow people to ask some questions before we close for the day. So just give me one moment. There are some questions already on the. Yes, let me get there. Thing. And I got to go down because. Um, and I have some other people that were saying hello from SoCal, San Francisco. <laughs> okay, let me get yeah. there. I thought I saw Arlene Wetter. Oh my gosh, Arlene, hello. <laughs> Email, this is very nice presentation. Thank you. And Lori's saying, thank you for sharing your wisdom with the scleroderma community. You have another thank you. And um, Mary Lou wants everybody to know she's had scleroderma for 27 years. And I love it because I want people to know that. I want you to know there is life after living with scleroderma. And I'm trying to see if there's any other. Um, oh, there's a lovely comment from Helene. Okay. Thank you, Helene. And unfortunately, whoever's raising your hand, we can't see who you are. So if you want to put something in the Q&A chat box, I'm, I'm happy to read it for you. Um, and Mary Lou says, great webinar on a much needed subject. Thank you for all the great references. Yeah. And I have to tell you, there is one person that um, who has scleroderma. Um, she came up to me at one of the conferences one year and said, well, I'm having a really great time, Elaine, but I hear the word scleroderma one more time. I might scream. <laughs> and that's that um, taught me that, yeah, you really need a vacation <laughs> from the disease. And it's hard to do that sometimes, but I, I really um, felt it from her. And it's so true. So true. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Tamisa, for your thank you. Mm -hmm. um, it's so nice. I see so many names that I recognize and some people I've never met in person and some that I'm going to be meeting soon in person. 
Let me see. Thank you from Carol. You're welcome, Carol. Uh, Laura, Christina, thank you for the coping skills. I've never thought of creating a set of coping skills to navigate with the emotional toll this disease takes on us. I am empowered and empowered is in bold capital now. Thank you. Uh, you just made my day saying that. That's beautiful. Thank you so much. And Joy. Hi, Joy. Love you both, she says. Another veteran. Yeah, we got some vets here. Yes, we do. And, um, says, thank, really you. thank you so much. Excellent information. And I really appreciate all the resources. Our pleasure. And again, right. make sure you have all of that when I send you guys the recap with the recording. Let's see what else I have here. Oops, sorry. My Somehow I'm pressing something that's making me not get where I'm at. <laughs> Unless that's you, Elaine. No, I'm not doing nothing. Okay, hold on a second. I'm, I'm going through the Yeah, the you're question. going through the questions. And so every oh, time I'm sorry. Try, you're taking it from me. <laughs> sorry. Here's, I okay. gave it back. Yeah, there we go. Um, Leanne, thank you. My granddaughter, Brittany Rudy. We love Brittany was told she only had six months to live 11 years ago. She is doing great. Yeah, she is a rock star. And she's also one of our co-leaders for our young adult support group. That Also, everybody, if you are um, a young adult, we have this support group in person and virtual. And you're more than welcome to attend from anywhere in the world and meet other young adults nice. with scleroderma. So um, thank you, Leanne. It's really nice that you're here supporting your granddaughter. She speaks so highly of you. Um, Tina. Yes. And this webinar to the people that didn't come, but did um, yeah. register. I always make sure that everybody that registered, whether they were able to make it here today, get a copy of the recording. Um, I send it out to everybody. So when I, when I do my recap, I blind copy everybody. And, but I make sure that Good. every single person that registered gets a copy of the recording and the, and the resources that I'll send along with it. Um, I have a couple more comments. Tina and Elaine, appreciate all you your help in giving us the power to beat this disease. Don't, oh, sorry. <laughs> she says you don't need to read it out loud. Sorry, should have read that part first. <laughs> Rachel, thank you. This was so encouraging. I got to meet her um, at the gala, and then she came to our support group meeting um, in Camarillo. And you're, you're another rock star, Rachel. Nancy, thank you for this information. Really helped me. George. Thank you for your presentation. You are welcome. And I think that's about it. Um, thank you, everybody, so much for being a part of today's presentation. We really appreciate you taking time out of your day. And I know that, like Elaine said, it's so nice to have something like this in person. Um, but we try to reach yeah. people from all over the world, which we can't do in person. And some people don't have these, these forums available where they live. And so this gives us that opportunity. So I just want to say thank you from the bottom of my heart. I hope all of you have a, a wonderful day. And Elaine, I can't thank you enough for yes. everything you do for the scleroderma communities. Uh, we appreciate you, oh, you so don't have much. So thank you. It's a wonderful part of my heart. We all know. you guys. Dedicated rock star. Okay, warriors, <laughs> have a beautiful, beautiful day. We love you guys. And we'll talk to you another time when we have another one. And if you haven't gone to a support group, please consider one in your local community. And if you need anything, you can reach out to me anytime by phone or email, and you'll have all that information when I send you um, the recap. Wonderful. Okay. Take care, everybody. Bye. Bye. Bye.